courts in Massachusetts today. So I want to bring Kathy Russin from courtchatter.com into the discussion because uh, Kathy and I have been chatting behind the scenes here, uh, trying uh, to keep track of exactly what's being argued and what's being said, uh, despite Kathy and I being two time zones away from one another. So uh, Kathy, <laughs> it's good to see you again. Good to see you too. Okay, so let's try to start from point A and then we'll we'll wind up with point Z at some point in the discussion. So uh, you had a, a very brief chance, and I realize it was a brief chance, but you did have a brief chance to look at what the estate was alleging in its uh, in, in its complaint against the Commonwealth. Okay, so well, what they're what they're alleging or what they're saying, and actually it was argued in the hearing today, is that there is a there's a correctional officer that's actually been on leave with pay that missed the t his 2 a.m. check on Hernandez. Oh, really? Yes. Okay, so now that's interesting. Yes, and that's what the defense is going is running with now. So there was a should have been a 2 a.m. check, and there wasn't. It, this is what is being alleged right now. So it, he was put in a cell at 8 p.m., and then he was um, found at around 3 a.m. And there was supposed to be a 2 a.m. check, and the, there apparently it is verified that there is a guard now on put, been put on leave. So in court today, it was argued that if that 2 a.m. check would have been made, that either he would have been interrupted is the words that Lee Entire, um, that the defense attorney used, that he that Hernandez either would have been interrupted or life-saving measures could have been taken. So that's what they are accusing, or at least alleging, uh, uh, to the Department of Corrections at this time. So they want, they ask the judge to preserve all evidence surrounding this event of Hernandez's death. And yes. then you've been reading that out, the order from the judge, and the judge granted their order anything to do with this death, anything in the cell, anything to do with the records, anything to do with the... Um, the guards that were supposed to be checking on him, anything to do with the um, any phone calls made, any visitors, anything surrounding his death. So that's not a big surprise, though, because judges usually are pretty quick on the draw to lay that order down and say, hey, everybody freeze and save everything because if you don't save it you're in violation of a judicial order the, the judges right. do like to really just just say okay everybody freeze save your stuff and then we'll sort it out later right so that is what he's done the only thing that he didn't order is the um defense attorneys that i keep saying defense attorneys but i guess they're representing the estate now mm -hmm. um asked to view the cell they want to go into the prison and view the cell and he said he is reserving an order. He's not addressing that at this time. However, the, represent, the representative for the Department of Corrections that was at the hearing today said she would be happy to speak with the attorneys about that request. That, I would suspect, wouldn't be horrendously problematic, but that's, uh, that is, I guess, for them to sort out. Um, I mean, I've been accredited to go into into prisons as a journalist, even when they were on lockdown. So uh, that doesn't seem like an unreasonable request. But if they can sort it out on their own, then I can see why the judge wouldn't necessarily put it directly in the order. Because in theory, that can be done at any time. It's not like a piece of paper that, you know, the judge is saying, hey, I need to freeze so that you don't throw this piece of paper away right now. You know, they can go into the cell in a month, and I, I don't think that it's in the Commonwealth's budget to rebuild the whole jail cell between now and then and alter it in any way. Right. So uh, we've been talking about the points of uh, preservation here, and uh, it, it's, it's an all-encompassing list of, I think, 12 different things that uh, need to be preserved. But l let me try to go back into the original allegation here. So the estate seems to be arguing a couple of things. Uh, they're arguing that the jail guards should have been keeping a closer eye on Hernandez uh, and that had they done so he th there's at least some chance that he wouldn't have killed himself or that they would have found him in the process of killing himself and that they could have gotten to him and rendered some kind of an aid is, is that the majority of the estate's argument or is there more 
Well, that is what was said in the hearing today. Okay. So at least that was what was argued um, orally today was that um, it could have possibly been, and I think the word interrupted was used, that had the check been made at 2 a.m., that he could have been interrupted. And I'm assuming this means his suicide attempt could have been interrupted or life-saving measures could have been successful. Yeah, I'm looking through some of the documents now that we've we traded back and forth just before we started this. And uh, for those of you watching, uh, we beg your patience because uh, we try to talk about things uh, the second we get them and uh, we have to read them as well as talk about them at once. So, uh, you know, it looks like there's an allegation that, that he was alone for seven hours without any, you know, guard passing him. Uh, that... You know, it seems like a long time, but I don't know what their standards are in Massachusetts. Are you? Well, reading? that's why the I, that's why um, the report is there should have been, there was supposed to be a two a.m. check, and that check did not happen. Okay. So obviously, I guess the standard is that that should seven hours should not have gone by like that. Okay, let me ask this: Did the uh, death certificate uh, have anything about the time of death, or did they approximate it? Or did they try to estimate it, or were they not able to calculate it? That is a great question because I have it in front of me here, but I have not gone over the entire death certificate. So I am. Yeah, and, at and, this and the moment. copies, the copies that are floating around are a little bit fuzzy to read on the internet too because they're not, you know, true originals. So, um, you know, that raises an interesting question because if if there was not an investigation or, or a determination as at the time of death then uh, I could see potentially the estate pointing fingers at the, at the state and saying that they're trying to sweep this lack of a check under the rug. Uh, well, the, you know, they called it at 4.07 a.m. on the death certificate, but that was after life-saving attempts. You know, they have yeah. to go through because they went into a cell at 3 a.m. But on the death certificate, it says time of death, 4.07 a.m. So the question is whether they did any... Um, you know, examination to try to to uh, calculate further. Um, yeah, that that's an uh, that's an interesting one. Uh, that's that's really interesting. So, uh, you know, was when he was found, did he show any signs of life, or or is that just the time that they decided to just call it? A and that's an answer that right. neither of us may have right now. I mean, it's. Uh, uh, but it's the sort of question that I can picture the estate asking as, as part of uh, this this um, this investigation as they're deeming it right now. Right. Okay. So I've got so I have a little bit more information. So this says the the complaint states seven hours went unaccounted for prior to the discovery of Aaron Hernandez's body. Um. And so that's the, that's, sorry, like you said, I'm reading this on the fly here. Um, and the, and Lee and Tyre's argument in court was the allegation is that, sorry. Again. That's okay, Kathy, take your time. We're, yeah. we're uh, reading and talking I'm reading, I'm reading it and talking along with you at the same time too. And to respond to one of the questions that's being asked in the uh, the chat room right now, time of death would be called by the hospital and not the prison. Uh, that's uh, that's likely. But what I'm trying to get at here is whether the medical examiner was able to back up and then say, well, he had been dead for one hour or two hours or three hours before that. That's what I was. Uh, I was trying to uh, to get at with that discussion just to clarify a little bit. Because okay, so okay, here's the wording. The complaint alleges that if anyone had checked on Aaron Hernandez before 3.03 a.m., then this is in quotes, these events might have been interrupted. There is also an allegation that if anyone had checked on Aaron Hernandez, quote, life-saving aid could have been rendered. Mm -hmm. So that's what was... Uh, well, that's what is in the complaint, apparently, uh, and they, that is why and that, that that DOC worker has been put on leave with pay. 
that was supposed to make the 2 a.m. check. What's the cause of action in this? Do you have the first page of it? Are they alleging negligence or are they alleging negligent supervision or are they alleging some something else here? I thought it was negligent supervision, but I don't remember for sure. And I don't remember if that I whether I saw the exact verbiage of what their cause of action is here. Because I don't think that I've got anything that, I don't think I have the first page of it yet. I got, the, I pulled up the original one. You know, they did an amended one last minute. Mm -hmm. And I don't have that in completely. I have the first one. And that was just preliminary injunction and temporary restraining order. Suing this state for the supervision he received was ref seven hours left alone. Yeah, negligence, uh, negligent supervision. Yeah. Now I'm going to have to do a little research into the uh, causes of action for negligent supervision. So uh, you can picture what my Friday night's going to look like here. <laughs> so, uh, you know, this uh, this has just been unfortunate for all involved, and it's it's sad to um, you know it's sad to think about those left behind. But in the meantime, there's a legal side to this, and I think that it's important for people to know the you know the causes of action. And and if we're going to believe that there's a sense of justice in the world, then you know there are causes of action for uh, things uh, that uh, you know that should have happened that didn't. And uh, you know, negligent supervision might be a tough cause of action though, because you know the proximate cause. The factual and the proximate cause, I'm trying to remember all my tort law now, and it, it's been a while, so I have to shift back into that. Um, you know, I'm wondering what the what the uh, the cause and fact analysis would require, because just because they didn't check the cell doesn't necessarily mean that he would be alive. You well, know, like the, the, there's well, here's all these my thing, too. I mean, I guess they have their, you know, their processes in place, but he wasn't on a suicide watch. And not they, at they this didn't have any indication that he was suicidal. Not at this particular moment. I think he was on one at one point, but I don't think he was at, at that particular moment. No, and it's my understanding the only time he was ever on one was right after his conviction for the old Lloyd murder, which is standard. That's standard protocol. Okay. So um, when you're um, sentenced to, uh, when you're facing a life sentence, I think that's standard protocol, and I don't necessarily think that he was on a suicide watch based on any actions on his part so and that was in 2015 so and and from what we saw of him in court that whole time there's no indication he was suicidal and he wasn't on an official suicide watch now I guess missing the 2 a.m. watch is what they're going to go after negligence for but I mean I, I don't think there was any indication he was suicidal. I guess I'll find out. I mean, I guess they're going to interview everybody around him, and, and they're going to review all the jail calls uh, that he had leading up to this. Yeah, now those phone calls are going to be interesting, because if there's even a shred of something, then um, they, they may be the most critical pieces of evidence here. And even if they show nothing, if they show no suggestion that uh, he was... Uh, even remotely considering this, then it just makes the um, makes the situation that much more, I guess, suspicion. But if the calls show nothing, then it would back up any claim by the Commonwealth that, hey, why should we have put this guy on a frequent watch or any kind of a suicide watch? Because he didn't exhibit any signs whatsoever that he might even be going there. Well, he was on a phone call with Shanna right up into, until phone call hours shut down. Mm -hmm. So he was on a call with her until he was, until almost until 8 p.m. is what the reports are. So she was the last person to speak with him, but we don't know the details of that call. Yes, and it's, it, that's going to be interesting. Now, I don't know if you've ever listened to any phone calls from prison at length, Kathy, but to, when I worked in a prosecutor's office, uh, I was assigned to spend days listening to them, and it was uh, um, 
they were interesting, I'll just say. I've heard some. <laughs> now, have you ever, uh, well, I, I, I don't want to get into any of the, the work that I did there because I don't know if I'm at liberty to discuss it but um, you know I'm trying to remember whether those whether those calls are subject to an open records request in Massachusetts either uh, because even if they are most states have a, a stop gap in the back of the open records law that says that if they're bound for litigation that they can deny their records to the press or, or to other parties under the open records law because they're bound for litigation and uh, that always used to um, irritate me as a journalist because if they're there and they're out then they're out but uh, the, the reason for it is that so that th the broadcasting of many records just apparently doesn't sully a jury pool so right. um, you know th that would make it a little bit tricky assuming that Massachusetts follows that model which most states do uh, that would be tricky for us to get our hands on a, before any litigation over the issue, but it's it certainly, um, you know, I think the judge's order was pretty specific and it was pretty broad. Yeah, I'm telling you, one of the, well, there's, there's many interesting factors to this, <clears throat> this entire situation to me, but one of the interesting factors is the other inmate that has now been placed on suicide watch. The, he, there is an inmate that was the last one to have contact with Hernandez that is very, reportedly very close to him, a very close friend of his, and he's been put now on suicide watch. Okay. That, very that's... little information coming out about this other inmate, but he was the last one to have contact with Hernandez. So there's a, there's a mystery right there, and what does that guy know? And then the three notes that Hernandez left, uh, today, today, um, the, the defense attorney said that Cheyenne found out about those notes and the family found out about those notes through the media. They still don't know anything about those notes or what those notes, what they contain. Yeah, I'm trying to figure that out because the initial report of the death didn't contain anything about those notes. And then it, it came out, I think, um, I know TMZ had it, and I don't remember if they were the first ones that had it or, or what. Uh, and then all of a sudden it exploded that there were these alleged notes out there, but it wasn't part of the initial report. So I'm still trying to figure out exactly what was out there. The allegation is that there were notes to uh, the daughter, the fiance, and to the public. I, at least that's one version of it. Um, yeah, and there's, an, there's another version out there, but there's... Yeah, there's, <laughs> there's a, a couple, couple different versions of it. There's a few versions so, out there. Yeah, there's a few different versions of it, and, you know, half of... You know, this is the thing. I mean, you get unnamed sources, everything gets lost, and then, you know, everybody jumps on and then concocts their own version of it and everything. But, uh, you know... I don't know why we didn't hear that, assuming that it's true, right from the from the get-go by the the prison authorities. I, I can't remember whether an initial report said that there wasn't a note or not, but it, uh, you know, maybe they just didn't figure that it was their province to to say anything about it, assuming that they were there. I don't. Well, know. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of oddity and a lot of oddity. There are a lot of oddities, and there's a lot of, um, you know, okay, well, where did this come from? Who said it? You know, what's the deal with this uh, Bible verse on the forehead? First, it was in blood, then it was in blood red ink, and now it's just in ink. And this this whole thing has taken on a bit of a life of its own. Well, I mean, anything to do with him, it tends to do that. But I do believe now it was the DA's. Um, statement about this on um, death when they came out with their official statement I believe their statement mentions note left next to the Bible so that's when we first heard about the notes okay but um, but the family claims that they don't at least today um, that's what that Lee and Tyre said on behalf of them that they have not been notified about them or what they contain what they say yeah, so it'll be interesting to see how this shakes out. So, uh, Kathy, did you see anything else with this that you want to point out, or have we covered as much of it as we uh, as we can here on the fly? Well, I think we have probably covered it, unless something's coming out since we've been talking about this. All right, well, let's, uh, let's get back to doing some more analysis here. I put a very, very brief article up on the web. I want to finish it as I get a chance to comb through the documents. And, uh, Kathy, I appreciate you joining me again here on the Law News Network, and I'll see you again next week, I'm sure.
Okay, we'll talk to you later. Okay, let's go back and listen to some of the testimony from the Stephen Jones case. We played up toward the end of his direct examination by his own attorney yesterday. Uh, that occurred yesterday. We just played it for you before Kathy and I started chatting. Uh, but we have more from his testimony yesterday that we want to catch you up on in case you missed it. We're waiting for the live testimony to resume, I would guess, in about 15 minutes. Until then, we're going to continue listening to some of the testimony of Stephen Jones. Uh, we're going to start with clip 64 and uh, go from there. And as soon as the live testimony continues in Flagstaff, we will bring you there live. 